we're looking at part four now of substance and evidence. And of course, all of this is talking about coming through the tabernacle. Now, I want to say this before I even begin. Prayer has a pattern. It has a process. Without the pattern and the process, prayer can become very laborious. Prayer can become very difficult even. Prayer can become so difficult that you just refuse to do it. Prayer can become so laborious that you look at it and you say, "What? Well, I'll do it later. i got something else to do now. And when later comes, you say, oh, well, now, not now. I, I'll, I'll. You know the drill. Prayer can become a very difficult thing, and that's exactly what the, your, the enemy of your soul wants it to be. He wants it to be hard for you to try to communicate with God and for you to, kind of, uh, for you to make the attempt to get in lockstep with God. But the reality is that when you come through the Word of God the way God designed it, then prayer can become a literal and rea uh, the reality of joy because you can sense and feel yourself in the presence of God. And, and as for me, I spent years and years of years in the I don't understand prayers. I, I don't get it, God. Why, God? How come, God? Uh, Lord, you know, I look around and you're blessing people that aren't even living right. Why is that? Why am I stuck over here whenever there are people over there not even living right? And it seems like they're being blessed. Why, God? I don't understand that, God. Do you know for the last better than a year, I've never had that prayer. I've never dealt with that. As a matter of fact, I don't even think about it. Because of the plan and the pattern of prayer and the process of prayer that I'm using, I don't get bogged down in anything else but the knowledge that at the end of my prayer, there's going to come a time when I sense that I'm walking into the presence of God. And the whole motivating factor for me is that as I pray, I know that at the end, I'm going to walk into the presence of God. And when I do that, the, the prize is set before me. I can almost hear Paul say that we are headed towards the prize that is set before us. And prayer now becomes something that is a joy, something that I look forward to because I'm not stuck in the mode of God I need, God I want, God how come. God, I, I'm tired of seeing everybody else get this and get that and I ain't getting nothing. And they ain't living for you like I'm trying to live for you. You ever been there? But that's not been the case for me since I learned how to seek God in an appropriate fashion because once I get into that mode, I forget about all that other stuff. And I simply have, at the end of the day, <coughs> the dangled carrot out there that I know that I'm going to walk into the presence of God in just a few minutes. And my friend, that changes everything. That makes the joy of the Lord my strength and not the struggle of life my trial. That's different. That's a different place to be. So let's stand. <coughs> the Bible says, read that for me, Juliana, while I'm getting a drink of water. Yep. That's it. Now let's pray. Why don't you pray for me too? Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your house this morning. And we just praise you for your word. And we just thank you for how God that you bring us this message, Lord, that it will touch our hearts, Lord, that you give us understanding and help us in our heart and help us bring us into your presence, Lord, that we may walk in it. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Be seated. So now we have seen that faith is a substance, and that substance is Jesus Christ. So our anticipation as well as our expectation is all revolving around Him. Now that changes everything. That changes everything. Because whenever I understand that my faith is wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in Him, and my anticipation and expectation is in Him, then I have something to do. That is, go directly to what He did for me. 
and directly to what he promised me. Now, I've told you many times about the things that the cross did, and I'm going to just mention the two of them without going into depth. The cross did two things for you. Number one, it translated you. It translated you out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Number two, it transfers to you so that you can be transformed and conformed into the image of his dear son. So when we find that Jesus is the substance, we have our expectation totally and our anticipation totally in him. We also see that our evidence which is the sweet-smelling savor that comes from the smoke in the tabernacle from the altar of incense, that this is a proof of his accomplishments upon the cross. Now, because the savor is the expression of the fire of the Holy Spirit represented in the coal and the blood which covers the coal and the spices which represent Jesus Christ as being the blood, giving the blood, the lamb, the lion, and the king, we can have complete expectation and anticipation when we pray that if we come through the thing the right way, that it's going to be Jesus Christ that is going to usher us and is going to sit at the right hand of God and say about your need and about the promises that apply to your need, yes and amen. That's a beautiful thing to know. Today we're going to see that our faith in him is to become, that, that he becomes our servant for the appropriation of the promises that are in him and are based upon our ability, now watch this now, to keep and complete His commandments. If you want to learn how to get faith to work for you, then the first thing you have to understand is how to know and keep the commandments that God has given for you in His Word. Let's look. Does he think that serv does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. Now, doing the things that we are commanded to do will allow us to then be able to command our faith. So what are we commanded to do? Well, we're commanded to pray, we're commanded to love, we're commanded to give. All of those things were given with a pattern. Let me prove it to you. Do you know why we love? For two reasons. Because God is love and because he first loved us. So there's a pattern there. We are children of God. We can be no more or no less in character than God. So what do we do? We love. You see that? All right? Now, we pray. Why do we pray? Because Jesus said, when you pray, there's a commandment there. He taught us the model prayer. The model prayer we have already determined goes right back to the tabernacle prayer. So, when we pray identifies that ex the, there is an expectation in the commandments for you not only to love, but for you to pray. Prayer is something that the Bible said Jesus got up early and did. He separated himself from the disciples. One time he took his inner circle and brought them with him while he moved away from them to pray. And do you know what they did? They did the same thing we do. They fell asleep. They did the same thing we do. They, they stopped. Jesus said, can't you watch with me just an hour? While I go pray, see, prayer is an essential commandment for man to be able to live and walk in the presence, power, and authority and dominion of God. It's essential. So, does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Are you doing the things that God has commanded for you 
to be able to walk into his presence and appropriate the promises that are in Christ Jesus. Are you spending the time? Are you spending the hours to be in prayer and come through the process? Now let's look. Our servant is the substance of both our hope and our faith. Faith is the divine system of relationship that God has provided for us to operate so that we can function in the divine image of God. Now watch this. When Jesus, in his office, before he became Jesus, was born into the world, his office was to be the spokesman from heaven. He was the one that spoke and gave the Holy Ghost something to work with that created the earth. He spoke and said, light be, and it was. Jesus was the officer in heaven, from heaven, before the world was made, that was utilizing himself to speak faith-filled words into the atmosphere, and the Holy Ghost, like a fisherman with a hook on the end of it, grabbed a hold of that thing and pulled it into place. What a thing. What a, what a revelation. So I'll say it again. When Jesus, the man we know as Jesus, who served as they are in the office of spokesman in the were in the heavens prior to the making of earth spoke faith filled words the holy ghost like a fisherman grabbed a hold of those words and pulled them into place like a fisherman pulling a fish out of a sea and there it was he said he spoke light and there it was all of the things that were created were created by Christ in his office as spokesman when the world was made. It's a divine plan that God used to allow the earth to be spoken into existence. Jesus was the one doing that. The Holy Ghost was the one executing his word. God, the Father, was the one planning with them the great plan that would put in place not only the earth, but the plan of salvation. Now, the divine plan of God for man is that man will live and be in the image of God. Let me prove it to you. When God created everything that was created, he brought them before Adam so that Adam could then look at them and by his tongue give them the name by which they would forever, eternally be identified. And whenever Adam began to name everything that was named, God stood back and the Bible said he was uh, marveled at what Adam was able to do as he spoke to the lion and it became forever known as a lion. See, God has placed into the tongue of man, according to the writer of the book of Proverbs, Solomon, the tongue of man to be life and the tongue of man to be death. Faith comes by your being able to live under the, the substance by which Jesus Christ has given you at Calvary and then cause your ability to say unto the sycamine tree, or whatever your circumstances are, and that tree begins to obey, or that circumstance is turned to obey because your tongue is operating in the image of God's dear Son. Now, He is Jesus, the substance, and this system is the means whereby we are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. 
Our ability to receive or take what he offers becomes our ability to appropriate what he has already offered us in the gift of his son. And all of those offerings came strictly through the blood. So anything that God has brought to the people by faith, by Jesus Christ, our substance and our evidence, was brought to us because he shed his blood for us to have it. He shed his blood for it to belong to you when you brought your need before him. The blood was there. The blood was there. The blood covered it. The blood took care of it. It was all appropriated in the blood. It was not appropriated because of any other reason than Jesus went to Calvary, died, shed his blood, and in shedding his blood made the avenue whereby grace through faith in Jesus Christ would meet every need that mankind would ever have, would ever purpose if that man knew how to get to God. But if he doesn't know how to get to God, let me tell you where he is. He's like most of the world. He's looking through a glass ceiling. He knows there's something beyond it, but every time he tries to go there, he bumps his head. Every time he tries to go there, it gets thwarted. Every time he tries to go there, something stops him. It's the crawdad theory, as we call it. You ever watch a bunch of crawdads in a, in, a, in a glass jar? There'll be one crawdad, and he'll be down there in the bottom, a whole bunch of them down there milling around. Next thing you know, one, one guy will crawl up the side of the, the jar, and he'll just about get to the top. And do you know what those crazy crawdads will do? The one guy that's about to get somewhere, they'll jump up and pull him back down in the batch. And then there'll be another one. He'll just about climb himself up out of, the, out of the glass jar. About the time he's ready to get to the top, there'll be another one. He'll jump up, grab him by the leg, pull him back down. Huh? That's the same way that the church and the enemy often is attacking your faith. They'll tell you, well, now maybe God isn't really in that healing business. Maybe, maybe, maybe God is just not hearing you. Maybe God has, uh, your, your past life has caused God to turn a deaf ear on you. Maybe, maybe you and your argumentative nature, uh, uh, when you get upset all the time, is causing God not to listen to you. Maybe, maybe if you would have treated your children better, God wouldn't be turning a deaf ear to you. God has closed up the heavens where you are concerned and you need, you just need to come and boy, we, we got to lay hands on you. We got to toss you around. We got to take your hair down. We got to change the way you look. We got to change the way you dress. Then maybe God will decide that you're good enough for him to answer your prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, that's stupid. God doesn't operate that way. But God does operate in a way. Now, I want you to hear what I just said. God does not operate in that way. But God does operate in a way. Now, the way God operates is that he must see you in Jesus. He must see you in Jesus. If he doesn't see you in Jesus, and you don't come by the correct pattern and fashion, then you are standing there, and all of the things that, and I'm going to show them to you in a minute, the devil will say to you, all of the problems the devil will rise, all of your past, all of the things where you failed, all of the times where you begged God for something and it didn't happen, all of those will well up in you and it will be a glass ceiling. You'll know there's something beyond but have no idea how to get to it. You know why? Because you tried to go come to God through some way but not through 
the way God planned it. So, how did God plan for you to come to him? Well, I've told you. He said, keep my commandments. Do my commandments. Love because I am loved. Pray because I taught you to pray. Give because I taught you the pattern of giving. Do the things that develop my character. And when you develop my character and when you come by my pattern in my prayer, now let's take a look. We have the prosperity gospel. What did they tell you to do? They told you to give. They told you to plant a seed. They told you to make sure that your seed was your best seed. Is there truth in that? Absolutely there is truth in that. That's biblical teaching. That is what the Bible teaches about giving. But the prosperity of God is bigger than that. The prosperity of God is not relegated to money. How do I know that? Because on the cross, the plan of God that transformed and conformed you was bigger than that. Your wealth is important to God, but so is your health. So is your anointing. So is the places that you would carry the gospel. So are the words that you say. So are the things that your eyes look at. So are the things that your uh, ears hear. So is the way your mind, will, and emotions work. It's a bigger picture than just saying, I'm going to give tithe so God will make me rich. That is a part of the plan of God. Don't misinterpret that. There is prosperity in the gospel. But that prosperity means that when I go to God in prayer through the right pattern. Now I want you to get this because the Holy Ghost stopped me right here. I want you to hear it. Did you see the pattern of giving that the Bible has laid out for you? The Bible said, given it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. Uh, uh, Malachi said that if you would bring into the storehouse, God would open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. You wouldn't be able. Do you see the pattern? Did you see the pattern of love? God is love. He first loved you. Love the brethren even as yourself. See the pattern? Prayer is no different. Now, in the, in, if I were to take those three things and I would say to you, the first thing that you need to do is understand the pattern of love. The first thing you need to do is understand the pattern of love. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Love is not tolerance. Listen very clearly. Love is not tolerance. Tolerance simply means that I accept you, and therefore I validate you. That's tolerance. Love is not tolerance. People have this thing all twisted. Love is not tolerance. Because the same tolerant Christ looked at the religious of his day and called them vipers and told them they acted just like their daddy, the devil. That came out of Jesus' mouth. The man who was the son of God, the man who was the gift of God, the man who was the love of God. Love is not tolerance. Love means that I love you, I am deeply, ultimately caring, concerned, about you, I have an affection for you, I will take care of you, but love does not mean that I can sit here and tolerate behaviors that are contrary to the Word of God. God has never promised any man, woman, boy, or girl that they can live however they wanted to live and go to heaven. Never. There has never been the toleration of heaven. There has been the love that brought about the grace of God. 
The grace of God says I love you enough to forgive you. I love you enough to forgive you. I love you enough to forgive you of your sin. I love you enough to forgive you of your ignorance. I love you enough to forgive you of your rebellion. I love you enough to forgive you of your harsh and hard words. I love you enough to forgive you of your doubt. I love you enough to forgive you of your fear. I love you enough to forgive you of your lust. I love you enough to forgive you of your pride. I love you enough to do that. In the end, the grace of God will love any man who will come to him in forgiveness. But the grace of God is not a grace of God that tolerates things that are contrary to his word. Not going to tolerate that. Love does not mean toleration to acceptance. Doesn't mean that at all. Because if he did, he would be a liar in his own right. If that was the truth, God would be a liar in his own right. God would have to bow down to the places like Sodom and Gomorrah. He would have to bow and repent of his action. God is not in the business of tolerance. God is in the business of loving you to forgiveness. And giving you grace when you need grace. That says to you if you'll believe in me. And then there's this thing about prayer. Prayer is essential. Because prayer is the mechanism whereby you have the plan to come to God. Jesus taught it. Jesus did it. God met with him. God, the Bible said that he did what he saw and said what he heard. Did that in prayer. The pattern of it was given to the children of Israel. I'm preaching it to you. Now someone's going to look at me and say, Oh my God, that's the most intolerant preacher I've ever heard. Now I want to say this to you. I am the most loving preacher you've ever heard. Because I'm telling you about a love of grace that will forgive you. I'm telling you about a methodology through the Word of God that will forgive you of your sin, wipe them away, wash them as far as the east is from the west, because I love you enough to tell you that there is a God in heaven that has spoken, and His track record is that those that are disobedient to His Word are those that reap the consequences and the punishment of Him Himself. Now that's the truth. I'm not intolerant. I live in love. I'm not intolerant. I just look at things and weigh them by the word of God. That's what I do. That's how I live. I weigh them by the word of God. I don't put my own idea, my own opinion on top of it. I ain't God. All I can do is tell you what the Word of God says and how the Word of God operates, and I'm telling you there is a pattern to love. Showed it to you. Right? There is a pattern to giving. Showed it to you. And there is a pattern to prayer. If you miss out on any of those three things, my friend, well, it's going to be very hard to talk about love and be tolerant and accepting, accepting of everything. It's going to be very difficult to talk about giving and never give anything. It's going to be very difficult. And it's going to be very problematic to us to expect God to enact his promises for us and never learn how to pray. That's a problem. That's a problem. So, so likewise, when you have done all these things which are commanded you. What is commanded you? Well, you're commanded to love. You're commanded to give. You're commanded to pray. You're commanded to witness. Is there a pattern to witness? Yeah. What did Jesus say? And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, and the rest of the world. There's a pattern. You can't get around it. 
God has a plan and a design for everything. What is commanded for us to do to make us and our faith ready for meeting God? Well, now we're talking about prayer. What do we do? What do we have to do? Well, we have to come by grace through the cross. They're crucifying your flesh. Then you proceed to come through the intense search of your inner man to refine your spirit and thereby become priests unto God. By this process, we know that we now have the right to enter into the holy place. Now, church, if you're going to pray, do not begin your prayer with, Lord, I love you and I need. Lord, I, I, I think a whole lot of you, and I appreciate my pastor. I think my pastor is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and, and for me, I really do, because I am he. But I want you to see something here. The process for you to get to God is not for you to come to God like this. The process for you to get to God is to come to God like this. I drop all of me. Palms down. I drop all of me. I, I drop my, my thoughts. I drop my cares. I, I cast all my cares on you. And I'm going to work on this part of me crucifying me. Then I'm going to work on the part where I, I bring my spirit, my inner man into subjection, where if there be any wicked thing in me, if there's a wicked thought in me, if there's a wicked idea in me, if there's a wicked comment in me, if there's a sharp tongue in me, whatever the case may be, I wash that by the water of the Word. See here? Here is where the world is missing it. Because we are tolerating everything and we are accepting everything, never understanding that things have to be sanctified before they can see God. You have to be sanctified before you can see God. You have to be cleansed and refined by what? The washing of the water by the Word. So if the Word demands activities and collects them under all as the activities of sin... That man will never see God. Did you hear what I said? If the Word collects the activities, places them under the works of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, the lust of flesh, and collects them and places them in, as activities under the topic of sin, and that is never sanctified, washed, by the water of the word, that man will never see God. That man will pray, but he will bump his head on the ceiling. That man will seek, he will look for, but he has not gotten his inside squared away until God can say to him, come up higher. Now these are truths about prayer. Until we come to search the inner man, David said those wonderful words, Search me, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Try me, O Savior. See that? There has to be an inspection of what you are expecting your spirit man to do. Now watch this now. When you pray, you are not going into the throne room in your flesh. You are going into the throne room in your spirit, man. You're not walking in there as you see you right now. I told you that. You're walking into the throne room under the personhood of Jesus Christ. Your spirit, man, is bearing witness with the spirit, according to Romans 8, and you are living in the spirit of life and when you pray, your spirit man is boldly having access into the throne room of God. You will never do that until you sanctify yourself. Until you crucify your flesh and sanctify your spirit man. Washed in the water 
of the word. Never do it. Never do it. God is not a man that he can lie, church. God is not a man that he's going to look at you and say, hey, I'll cover my eye to that. You just keep doing, I, I won't look. I was talking to somebody the other day. I remember Captain Kangaroo. Y'all remember Captain Kangaroo? Some of you young folk, too young, Captain Kangaroo. Captain Kangaroo was a great guy. Remember whenever he used to play hide and seek with the bunny? Huh? Yeah. You, do you remember that? Yeah. And, and, and they would be behind their desk, and the captain would say, uh, uh, okay, bunny, go hide. And the captain would be right here, and the bunny would be right here, and the bunny would go. And the captain would count to ten, and the bunny wouldn't go anywhere. Remember that? And the captain would say, caught you. And the bunny would say, how did you do that? I don't think in all the shows I ever watched, the bunny ever figured it out. God's not going to turn his head, close his eyes to the parts and pieces of you that you refuse to sanctify, to the parts and pieces of you that you refuse to bring under the blood. Everything in your life, if you expect God to answer your prayer, must be sanctified according to the word of God. It is the washing of the water by the word that cleanses your inner man and prepares you. to. Now listen, 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 listen. Once I crucify my flesh, how often do I do it? Every day. Every day. I get up in the morning, begin to pray. Lord, I crucify my flesh today. I crucify my wants, my ideas, my opinions, my tongue. I crucify everything about the 17 works of the flesh that could separate me from the love of God. I, I crucify that today. I bring my body under subjection. Then I go to the very next thing. Lord, now I am searching. And in my mind's eye, I am in my spirit, man, looking around. Is there anything in here, anything in here that would keep me from getting into the tent of blessing? Is there anything in me that would stop me? God, refine me today by the Holy Ghost so that my spirit, man, can see only you. So that you and me are looking as reflective natures of each other so that in me is nothing but you in me is nothing but you till I'm satisfied with that I don't take another step but when I take the next step I want to tell you where I'm going I'm going to the place of blessing I know that whenever I get in there there's a blessing for me I know that whenever I get in there God is going to reveal himself to me how do I know it? Because I know what's on the other side of the door. I know what's on the other side of the door. When I get in there, I look at the lampstand and I see the process of God. I see how God did it. I, I look at all of that and I realize that in the base of the lampstand, I am the righteousness of God. I have cleaned my flesh. I have cleaned and purged and refined my spirit. And there I stand at the lampstand that lights up that glorious temple. And there I know that I am the righteousness of God because Jesus Christ has cleansed me, saved me, died for me, and his blood has made me totally free. Yes, sir. Now I can look at that and say, I want those seven spirits of God operating on the inside of me. I want wisdom to spring forth. I want understanding to come forth. I want counsel, might, the knowledge of God, the reverence and fear of the Lord, the judgment of the grace of God to swell up in me. It's a blessing you've given me. It belongs to me. Amen. Then I move over to the to the table of showbread, and I begin to transfer from God. This belongs to me. What is it, Mike? Well, my will now becomes his will. It belongs to me. My emotions are his emotions. It belongs to me. My, my mind becomes the mind of Christ. It belongs to me. My healing in my body becomes healing because it belongs to me. My very physical self is made well. My spiritual man is made 
great song. It belongs to me. I take it out of the table of showbread. I take the words of my mouth to agree with God in the covenant of God. I take the things that I see to be seen by God what Jesus saw. It belongs to me. I believe I receive. It belongs to me. Now that I get to the next step after however long that takes, now I see Jesus as my substance. He is the one that gave me all that. I see Jesus as the evidence. He is the one that's seated on the right hand of God. Whoever lives for me to give me every promise in him being yea and amen. See, faith has a substance, and its name is Jesus. Faith has an evidence, and its name is Jesus. I now live by that substance and that evidence. That's how I live. John 14, 23, look at it. He that hath my commandments, in other words, he that comes my way, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, I have to ask you a question. Do you love God? Now, do you love the Lord? You know how you can tell? Are you keeping his commandments? Are you loving like you should be loving? Are you able to determine the <laughs> length and breadth of love as you should be able to? Are you able to determine how to pray as you ought to? Are you able to determine how to give as you ought to? Are you able to determine how to witness as you ought to? That's how we're going to know whether you're following and living in the commandments, whether you're keeping them or not. He that keeps my commandments loveth me. And he that loveth me, now watch this because this is so crucial, shall be loved of my Father. You know what he's saying right there? He's saying the man that keeps my commandments has free access into the Father. The man that keeps my commandments has free access into the Father. Now I have to ask you, what is it you want? What is it you want? Do you desire to be saved and go to heaven? To, to, to wind up one day at the pearly gates with your Lamb's name written in the Lamb's book of life, and we all would say yes and amen. That's my desire. I want to get there. And I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to get there. Well, I'm going to tell you about that, friend. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Why, Mike? Because if you believed on the name of the Son of Almighty God and you've been saved, you're going to heaven. So just be saved. That's what 99% of the world is doing. They're just being saved. I heard one man say the other day he was in church. They started telling him he was going to hell. You're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. You're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. He said, well, I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, I, I, I don't want to go to hell. So he got saved so he wouldn't miss hell. Hmm. That's interesting. So did you. Ain't one of you in this room that didn't get saved so that you would miss hell. But the problem is, is that we have put salvation and eternity into this capsule, never understanding 
that Jesus taught and the plan of God for man was that there would be a heaven and there would be an eternal life. But Paul said, I have not attained, but I am following after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm not there yet. There's going to come a day when you will go to heaven. In the meantime, there is a prize of eternity that belongs to you right this minute and it is obtained by the substance and the evidence of the man Jesus Christ and it is given to you by faith and by the faith that is in him you do not have to just wait for heaven to get to the place where there is healing, where there is freedom, where there is no bondage, where there is no slavery where you will have not at that time only be able to overcome the devil, you can do it right now in this life. It belongs to you. Yeah. It's yours. There is, and I've said this a million times, when I got saved, eternity started for me at that moment. How do I know that? Because John 3.18 said, He that believeth not is condemned already. The unbeliever's eternal life is already condemned. My eternal life began the moment I believed. Whenever I walk by faith and I find Jesus as the substance and the evidence of my faith, I can get to God. I want to get to God. I desire to get to God. And that verse tells me, He that keepeth my commandments, he it is that loveth me, he that loveth me will get to God. He, he is loved by my Father. Then watch what he said. He said, not only will he get to God, I will love him. And I will manifest myself to him. Now, what is it that you think Jesus might just possibly could maybe someday if it were just something out there somewhere possible that he could do that he might manifest to you? What is it that you think it could be? Let me tell you what it is. For every promise in him is yea and amen. That's the manifestation of Jesus Christ to his people. Every promise in the book. All of them under the seven demonstrations that transfer, that transform and conform a man into the image of his dear son. It belongs to you. It's yours. But it's only going to be yours if you understand how to pray about it. It's only going to be yours if you understand how to pray about it. He's only going to manifest himself to you when and if and only if you understand how to pray about it. When you understand how to walk into the throne room boldly. And there, the Bible said, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, that you would have access into the throne room of God. And there you would find grace. Hmm, isn't that something? The judgment of God in the throne room. Huh? Now wait a minute. Now wait now. Hold on now. I told you this. I'm going to prove it to you. Favor in the lampstand. The way, the influence of God in the table of showbread. The way God does things in the altar of incense. And then judgment of grace in the throne room of God. Enter into the throne room of God boldly, and there you will find grace. What kind of grace? It will always be the same. You know what it says? It says it will be the grace that gives you help in your time of need. It will always be the judgment of grace that dispatches a prayer, that dispatches a promise into the meeting of your need. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I gave you $5,398,788,552, I couldn't give you one thing more that would equal the value of what I just told you. I couldn't give you a dollar that would equal the value of what I just told you. Because I just told you that there is a judgment of grace that is standing in the presence of God and that you have access into the presence of God. And when you get into the presence of God, the judgment of grace, the judgment is yea and amen. Because Paul said that you would find grace, the judgment of grace, that would meet your need and be a help to you. Listen to it again. He said, and you have access into the throne of God boldly, and there you will find grace and mercy to help in your time of need. Now bow your head and close your eyes. Now what's your time of need? What's your time of need? Well, your time of need may be whatever it may be. But for you to get to the place where the judgment of grace works for you, to get to the place where grace and mercy, the judgment of grace brings the mercy of God that helps you every time. You have to get there in the way God prescribed for you to go. Anything else will leave you stunted, dissatisfied, asking questions, why not? We're not. How come? I don't get it. Where are you, God? Now, as you sit right there, I want you to consider this. Things that you've prayed about. Think about things you've prayed about. I want you to think about the times when the things you have prayed about have not materialized. Then I want to ask you the question. Prior to making that request, had you spent time crucifying yourself? Or out of the crisis did you turn to prayer? Out of the problem did you turn to prayer? Out of the issues of life, did you turn to prayer? I would venture to say that if reality was spoken, truth was told, you would all make relatively the same. You know, I, I, I was trying to pray. I was making an effort to pray. But then this crisis struck and I realized I better get the business. And I really prayed about the crisis. And so, now the next thing I want you to consider is life without crisis. Life without crisis. Now you're in life without crisis. You're in the wealth of the land. Now what are you praying about? Now what are you going to God about? Now how much time a day are you spending with God? You see, God is a merciful God and God is a loving God. God knows those that are His. And in your moment of crisis, God has come on the scene in mercy. And we have often walked away from that. We've been blessed by the mercy of God, but we've not developed within our heart and within our life a sheer and utter commitment to pray. Now, only you can evaluate the two, two spots I put you in today. Only you have the answer to that. I don't have the answer to that. Only you have the answer to that. Only you know whether you're a critical prayer 
or whether you are daily, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Only you know whether that's you or whether that's not you. I would venture to say, if you were like me before I found what I'm preaching to you, you were a critical. It was when it was critical you got down to business. But you don't get the benefits of the goodness of God under those terms. I want to show you what you get while your eyes are closed. You only get that particular situation potentially met. Or you only get that particular situation to lead you into questions about why God and where God. That's all that is being dealt with at the moment when you're praying in that crisis situation. I'm suggesting to you a lifestyle. I'm suggesting to you a way that David said or Isaiah said that you could be in perfect peace because your mind has stayed on him, crisis or not, peace or famine. That's what I'm suggesting to you. And the way is through your Savior, the man of faith, Jesus Christ. Now you make the, you make the call today. All I know is as for me, I want to be a man of prayer. So that when the crisis comes, and it often does, I'm not bowing on my knees crying and being a beggar. I'm coming to God as I do every day. And I'm in perfect peace because my mind has already been stayed on Him. My life has been changed. And there is no temptation that is common to man that I won't find my way of escape. That God will not dispatch mercy on my behalf because I've been in the throne room. And I found the judgment of grace. Now if that's what you would desire today. Then I want you to stand. And I want you to do two things. I want you to repent. Because you have. Utilized something that God meant. For you to have a relationship with him with. You've utilized that only to be a means whereby you could get around the circumstances of life. Or I want you to stand because you have not been the prayer person that you now see you should have been. Or I want you to stand because you desire, beyond desire, to know what it is to be. In the presence of God. Now whatever your prayer need is. From wherever you stand. It's your time to make a change. In how you perceive and approach God. Father as they're standing all over the church. I pray for them today. God only they know and only you know. What is in their heart. Their prayer life, their, their needs that they have brought to you under whatever conditions they have brought them. Father, as they stand today, some of them repent. Some of them realize they haven't been praying like they should have. Some of them realize that they want a deeper, greater, more developed prayer life in you than they have ever had. Whatever that need may be, God, that stands to their feet. Whatever that need may be. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would put into their heart, drop into their heart the fluid of the Word of God 
the fire of the Spirit of God that would cause them to begin to seek you and pray as never before until they enter into the throne room of God and there they stand to worship you. There they stand to pray for others long before they pray for themselves. Now with every head lifted, I want you to thank God. I want you to just say, Lord, I thank you today that my prayer life has been changed. That I see in me the need. The Word of God has charged me. I see it, Father. I receive it today. It belongs to me. I am your man and I am your woman and I want a deeper relationship with you. I know it comes through prayer. I know it comes through love. I know it comes through giving. I know it comes through witnessing. But today, I'm focusing on a new life in prayer. Now, Father, we take that today and we receive that from you. You are the God of glory. You have given us the word of God and you have shown us that Jesus is our avenue in. He wasn't only our avenue to be saved, but he's our avenue to get to the Father. For we have not a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet he without sin. So, Father, we come to you boldly today, and there we find access into the throne room of God. When we get there, we find the judgment of grace and the judgment of mercy that gives us help in time of need, that meets every need, dispatches and disposes of every promise of God. For in Him is yea and amen. I receive it. Say it with me. I receive it in Jesus' name. I receive it in Jesus' name. Say it again. I receive it in Jesus' name. I receive it in Jesus' name. Say, Holy Spirit, drop into my spirit the desire to pray and to seek God. The desire to follow the commandments and to be loved of my Father and to be loved of Jesus. And that Jesus will manifest himself to me. Will manifest himself to me. Will manifest himself to me. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen and amen and amen.